thank you very, very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Um, it is your taxes who pay my salary for the United Nations. So I have those of you who pay taxes. Uh, so I, I thank you all for for funding the United Nations, where we work with you and our member states to make trade more efficient um, and to yeah, support global development. So the story so far, imagine a, a James Bond movie where you first have to go through the car race and the past story and so on, and then, then what's, what's happened. Then we go to back to normal question mark. Um, then comes what's happening in Suez, Red Sea, Black Sea, Panama Canal, and a little bit into the future, some of the key challenges that I think are also very important for, for this group, for the suppliers, for the ship managers, the ship owners. Um, overall, the long-term trend is positive, and it's not so much in the news, because it's good news, actually. So I have three long-term trends with hard data we have looked at since 1960s, um, so, for example, for us, it is important that developing countries, as a group, increase their participation in shipping and seaborne trade. So, you see, in the 1970s, when I went to school, I learned that the world was divided in the north and the south. The south would just export raw materials and import low-volume but high-value manufactured goods. Today, including, of course, so-called developing countries like China, Singapore, and Korea, um, you have uh, a, a big share also of, of um, the, the unloaded, that's hard port data, the imports of iron ore, coal, oil to produce manufactured goods. So I think that's a long-term positive trend. Year after year, this has been growing. Another positive trend, logistics services have improved. Here I do not have global data, I have data, for example, from the United States. You see, within logistics expenditure, there are basically two types of expenditure. Either I pay for transport or I pay for inventory holding. And, and you know this in the supplier of, of equipment, of food, of lubricants. So either you move stuff or you store stuff. In the 1980s, in the United States, the economy would spend more money on inventory holding than on moving stuff. Today, well, I stop here, I go to the today in a minute. Uh, the, the economy spends twice as much on transport compared to inventory holding. This is not because transport is more expensive. Uh, the long term, transport has become cheaper per ton mile, per ton, and so on. More, more energy efficient, and better ports, better trade station. It is really an improvement in logistics, which I think is another trend of good news. The third trend where I don't have such a long time series, but we do see that year after year, ports also become more efficient. We can measure this with nowadays AIS data, satellite data, how long do ships spend in port. So although ships are getting bigger and loading, unloading more and more cargo per port call, the time they spend in port tends to go down in both de developing and developed countries. And then came COVID. For example, charter rates, freight rates, went through the roof. If we had more time, I could now spend half an hour explaining the demand supply curves, how ships spend 20% longer in port, and, and so on and so forth. But, but overall, you have experienced this. I want to share two slides that I found interesting. So when this crisis started, we made a forecast, a simulation, and said higher freight rates will actually lead to higher prices. Now, normally, I think our common story is to say transport is a derived demand. It is just a very small part of the final price of the good in the IKEA store or Walmart or Carrefour. But if the freight rates go up five times, it starts making a difference. So we forecasted that global inflation will go up by 1.5 percentage points due to the higher freight rates when COVID started when Paul Krugman was still saying, don't worry about inflation, yeah? And we were right. Um, six months later, the International Monetary Fund calculated the inflation that was then happening and said, Anktat was right, one and a half percentage point of the four, five percent inflation were due to our business, to higher shipping costs. 
And the second chart that I find particularly interesting also for this group, like you look at what, what impacts your own prices and, and then you contribute to the price increase or not. So I said 1.5% average increase. So here you have different products and for some products, some commodities, the increase in prices was much bigger. This one here, furniture, other manufacturing, is actually cheap goods. Imagine a white uh, plastic garden furniture, some really cheap good, where the content of a container may be 10 or $20,000. So if there the freight rate for a container goes up from 5,000 to 20,000, it starts having an impact. It makes a difference. But the one that I find really interesting is this one. So this is my, my Nikon camera. Here we have a Nikon night here and the photographer. Um, this is very expensive medical equipment, whatever. And you think if the content of a container is a million dollars and the, and the freight rate goes up from five to 20,000, does it make a difference? The thing is, and, and here also I understand what GenPro is doing with the deep supply chains, looking at and the provider of the provider of the provider, and what is the input, where is the emission, where is the social, where is whatever. So up to nine time deep supply chains. So the, the, the plastic part on the chip that goes into the Nikon camera, and then nine times deep. So here it accumulates. So if maritime sh if shipping costs go up, then even though the final product is not so impacted, it, um, it does have a, a bearing. I, I realize I'm talking too much. I don't know how time we have, but, but uh, th that was the story so far. Yeah? So you mentioned the James Bond movie. So, so now we start what's happening today. So what's happening today? Are we back to normal? COVID, is, COVID it went down again. No, you remember it went down. It used to go down. Interestingly, for the first time ever, the share of developing countries actually went slightly down. We had lockdowns in China, uh, Joe Biden and others printed money and we ordered in the rich countries, so the share went down. But I can tell you the latest data, what we have, the, the projection, I think or we thought, we expected to be back to the long-term trajectory. Same here. It went up. You know, especially in the United States, all the logistics problems, the huge inventory holding costs, all the things in the wrong place and, and storing. But again, the data, it's not yet published. It's normally published in June, the, the latest, the 2023 data. So I'm curious to see if we are a little bit back to normal, but I expect we should get back to normal. Then with the time in port during COVID, it did go up. And at some point in time, the developed countries actually had worse port performance than the developing countries. But again, the latest data, we are overall back to a positive trajectory. And then, sorry, again, now comes Red Sea, Black Sea, Panama, uh, updated just for you, the very latest full month of May data. Zoo is still really bad. Panama slowly Recovering, so th there we had some assessment published by UNCTAD, which I think was, yeah, we are quite proud of it, what, what all this means for, for distances. So one, one thing is, of course, also, that's the very latest data. First time again, back to, to above 3,000, the um, SCFI, the, the charter rates, almost 30,000. You see this in your daily news feed. So it is, yeah, we are worried again about prices, about interruptions, about congestion. And in the longer term picture, that is then the good news for the ship owners. <laughs> so distance has been going up, the three main markets. So oil is going over longer distance. And of course, most recently, oil from Russia is going to, to India and China instead of Europe. Um, Egypt is buying grain more from, from the US and Canada, now back from Ukraine. 
And this one, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a forecast, uh, but this one is um, container ships going around, around South Africa. You know? So distance going up and, and the ship owners and the shipyards and the financiers and the, they're all wondering, hmm, should I now invest in new ships because it's going well? But then there's so much uncertainty, so much risk. We don't know what will be the fuel of the future. We don't know when the Houthis will stop shooting. We don't know what will be with the political issue. So um, this risk, this uncertainty, of course, makes investors wait. That's classical microeconomics 101. The higher the uncertainty and risk, the higher the minimum rate of return I expect as an investor. And we have actually the global order book Container ships have now surged, but still the global order book for ships is quite low. If you think where it would normally be with these, with the profits, with investment, you would expect a bigger surge in new orders. And, and it's impossible to prove, but I'm personally convinced we would have a bigger order book if we had less uncertainty about future IMO levy, about future fuels, about future political situation, about this situation. One thing uh, I find particularly interesting, and, and we get a lot of questions, what about nearshoring? And so this is a, I find fascinating chart done by colleagues in Anktat who work in the trade division. So they have actually looked at what is a friend in economics, uh, in, in politics, who are my friends? So they looked at voting patterns, a little bit what Samuel Huntington did when he wrote clash of civilizations, who votes with whom, who is ob like who votes together. So those countries that vote together at the United Nations Security Council, they uh, have started to trade more with each other. Now the change is not big, huh? it's, it's a small scale here, but, but I do find it interesting. We certainly do not see near foreign, yeah? and I just showed you the charts how distances are going up actually, but we do see some friend shoring. Uh, and we see more concentration, like fewer providers, and then we, we have discussions with an actor. Is this good or bad? I would initially have argued it's bad, because to, die, to have better resilience, I need more suppliers, I need less concentration. But to the extent that some of this is among friends or even at home, some of my colleagues argue this may improve your resilience. I honestly don't know. Maybe we have time to discuss. So, a bit thinking about the future, and I was told we should have time for questions, discussion. So the two main issues that I find are important, and uh, it's not just Anktat saying this, but, but there's a, a lot of positive developments in digitalization and a lot of challenges in decarbonization. So, who led the IT reforms in your company? By the way, I, all photos are from Hoffman's Travels, and I just thought this guy must have a great overview of visibility of uh, IT connections. So who in your company led the IT reform? And, and we actually found it was mostly COVID-19 who led the IT reform. We have a lot of evidence where when the crisis started, many of our clients, members, uh, the, the port authority of Djibouti or the customs authority of in, in Bujumbura or so, they used to like paperwork, yeah? But they've realized it might not be a bad idea if I don't touch paper and other people. And I agree to finally do what Anktad had been preaching for decades about e-documents, pre-arrival, procedures, uh, electronic signatures, and so on. So th there has been a push towards positive reforms, which if you remember, I'd shown you this chart for the United States, this logistics vis-a-vis, -vis, like, like inventory holding versus transport. So the reforms and improvements we see in spite of COVID, actually we do see positive development here. What we have seen, and here again, we could spend, spend hours and go into many specific things, but we saw on the one hand a more motivation, what I just shared with you, this, this, yeah, I have to, whether I like it or not, I have to digitalize and go for e-documents and so on. 
But then, and that's a bit of a hobby horse of me, I, I love reading, eating books about AI and, and so on. I I'm, I'm don't claim to be an expert. There I speak with one of my sons who just is his master's in artificial intelligence, and he has a very proud daddy. But, but this is just amazing what is happening here. And, and here, um, um, so I like to say technological progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? It's not slow, it's fast. But it's going to be even faster. And the way AI systems learn from each other, and you've, you've seen the, if it's my wife, I'm, I'm not here. I'm, I'm not here. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yes, so this is like, like at the WTO when we were working with them on the trade station agreement. There were member countries when the negotiation started on this TFA, trade station agreement, that obliges countries to introduce single windows and so on. There were member countries who said, Publishing my customs duties on the internet? No, 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 that's too expensive. I cannot publish things on the internet. I'm a poor developing country. Now, that's 20, yeah, uh, 2004, the negotiations started 20 years ago. I think by now it's like obvious no, that, that, that we have to develop today's regulation. That's normally my business, the, the governments, the international organizations, but I would say also private companies don't think about today's technologies. Think about the future technologies when de you develop your business models. Same story here, decarbonization which is really the big challenge. We had a special chapter in our last review of my time, transport towards green and just transition. Um, this chart was the one that was most quoted in, in the press. Um, I heard somebody from Bloomberg is here. I think you quoted it too, and Financial Times and so on. So in spite of all the efforts um, about decarbonizing, during the last 10 years, emissions from shipping increased by 20%. And when we were about to publish it, there were colleagues who said, oh, no, no, don't publish this. And we had already sent it to the press and, and no, no, that's not good. And, and you have to, if you had started in 2010, it would not have been there, whatever they, they, so I reminded them of the Streisand effect. If we now with pull it back from the press release, then the press would really wake up. <laughs> um, so anyhow, so that's the bad news. The good news is that the, the trade had been growing even faster. So if I look at the emissions, especially in container, per ton or ton mile or, or whatever, uh, then it's, it's positive. It had actually decreased. So yes, we do see a positive impact of the IMO measures, of new technologies, of European Union measures and so on. So emissions per ton mile did go down. And sorry, I spoiled the, the now further bad news. So the glass is half full, half empty. Half of the improvement is due to economies of scale. If you look at the emissions for 20,000 TU container ship visa a small feeder, you clearly see that the emissions are much lower. No, uh, Alfred Marshall, Adam Smith, they, they already had shipping as the example for economies of scale. So, so here you see the, the actual change contribution of ship size. So there's a really important contribution of ship size. And I, I must say, we are not fans of ever bigger ships. They do pose challenges to the ports. They lead to peak demand. They, they have impacts on market concentration, which are not always good, especially for the smaller countries, smaller players. So I'm not suggesting that's a good thing. On the contrary, I'm saying, look, if half of the improvements due to economy of scale, that means the, the urgency to actually do something real if we want to decarbonize is even more urgent. And here too, sorry to repeat myself, uh, I am overall optimistic. If you look at how the, the capacity of battery has improved, how, uh, I mean, there are many things that have been improving faster and are improving ever faster. So in, in that sense, I think what, what Genpro and others are doing also to, to look at in the future how to measure this, how to provide services on how to know what is my supply chain doing with digital solutions, with the, the decarbonization. I think we are on the right track and I stop here and thank you all. Thank you very much.